Hello again and welcome to American Zarathustra. This is episode 30 of Imperium Art. We are very, very pleased to have with us Jerome Schmidt. Uh, we have so much to talk about today. We're really excited to have you with us. Jerome, how are you today? I am doing fantastic today. How are you guys doing? Super. And Nellis, how about you? I am doing wonderfully. Thank you very much. And hello, Donald. Hello to the audience. And hello to Jerome. Yes, and thank you very much again for, for co-hosting the show with me again, Nellis. Oh, so, yeah, so Jerome, let's let the audience know more about who you are. Introduce yourself. Let the audience know about your content and things that you've done online for us. Sure. Um, so my primary area of expertise is film and analyzing film. I am also an amateur filmmaker. And uh, I, I say amateur because until I have a feature film, then I'll officially say filmmaker. Mm. But uh, yeah, so that's my primary area of focus. Um, I have a serious passion for film, but also understanding the impact that it has on society, um, on white society, on on all places around the world, really, and just how powerful propaganda with film really is. Mm. So I've, ever since I was a kid, I was, I, I was watching so many movies and um, very early on, I was started to watch them not only just for entertainment value, but uh, the technical aspects of them, the kind of mood, the atmosphere, what is it trying to say? And so mm -hmm. it was kind of like a puzzle that you're trying to put together or some kind of code that you're wanting to crack. And so mm -hmm. that's what really drew me even further into it. And uh, I think film and art in general but uh, film more so than any other medium of art um, is incredibly important in, uh, for lack of a better word, I'll use the word dissident. Uh, so dissident spheres. Mm -hmm. because it's, uh, it really can dictate a culture and it can even influence political agendas and political action as well. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, you know, when when I, I'm on a show ECL with Tyler and Josh Neal and Fashi Zizek and we talk about films and just like in conscious cinema, but mm -hmm. it's not just movie reviews. We're analyzing culture and we have a culture and an art that is created for us, but not by us. And that mm -hmm. is completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. So we need to break down what these films are trying to say. But I also like to find work that is interesting and is a net positive um there is still good work around the world that's being made and i think it's important that people know that mm -hmm. interesting i have some experience in film mostly as a storyboard artist i'm actually technically a storyboard artist for a lot of films in my city uh, i've done script writing i always say that comics are films on paper have some acting experience. So I'm, it's something I'm extremely interested in. I'm actually working on a film as well right now. So it's a, it's really, a, a, for me anyway, very, very exciting to talk to you more about that. I've had a chance to look at some of your work. Um, unfortunately, I know that you can't show your work uh, right now and make that connection because of politics, etc. But I can attest that the production quality is very high and uh it, there's definitely you can tell that whoever's behind the camera really knows what they're doing and it, it's just just a, a world unto itself there so i i, I want to kind of think through breaking down film we're going to get into all these questions a little bit but i feel for the documentary of, of imperium art and this show in general let's get a little bit more into you and who you are so that brings a, a better like depth to the discussion on film. So if you could kind of back up a little bit and tell us about how you came to your own racial awakening. Yeah, I, I kind of had uh, an interesting path. Um, you know, I'm almost in my mid thirties now. I, I got into this very young, uh, actually as a teenager. Um, when I was about 15, I had an older friend that showed me a blank VH VHS tape of a certain documentary made by a Mr. David Cole about a, a certain camp in Poland. Mm -hmm. And it blew my mind. It mm -hmm. absolutely blew my mind. 
Um, before that point, I was never really tied to these narratives okay. anyway. So when I saw that, I just thought, oh, okay, yeah, this makes sense. This is uh, this country's kind. Of, this is just a lie. And then I just dug deeper into that. My high school actually had Irving's Dre- Dre- David Irving's Dresden book there. Wow, wow. Um, this is you know this is this this was a while ago. And uh, I checked that out, read that, and then I just started consuming all those kinds of things. And um, it, can, it, can you tell the audience who David Irving is and what he writes about? Yeah, David Irving, uh, he is a historian and a yeah. true historian. <laughs> and what he did was, unlike the other uh, history authors, was he went directly to the sources. He would go... Uh, to the archives in Germany and Britain and America and all over the place. And he learned German specifically right. just for this career. Wonderful. And he would translate all these um, documents. And so from that, he was able to uncover a lot of uh, truth that we that was being withheld from us. Mm-hmm. And so his uh, Dresden book, which came out in the 70s, um, was a big deal because it actually documented the tragedy that was the bombing on Dresden. Mm. Um, to that point, was relatively unknown by most people in the West, um, or it was seen as a, some glorious uh, win, you know, whatever it is. But it was actually an actual Holocaust, mm-hmm. and so he documented that. He interviewed face to face actual German soldiers and SS men and officers and high people that were in the in Hitler's inner circle and he gained their trust and so he was able to put out the actual truth and nice. it was received with rave reviews yeah um but then he started noticing that he could never find a single order from Hitler about the holocaust or anything right. like that. right and right. that led him down the path that most people know him for. And yeah. so he he's one of the people, I'd say, along with Ernst Zundel, who really led the crusade um, about uncovering the truth of the Holocaust. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Brilliant, brilliant. And I believe there's video out there of him doing lectures as well, if people want to look him up. Um, ironically, he's a friend of mine... Very, he's a very charismatic man. I mean, he's very fun to listen to and watch. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got a sense of humor. He, he knows how to deliver a speech in an entertaining way. Weirdly enough, just last night, a friend of mine was showing me a book that he just bought of, of his, and also he, he somehow managed to buy a, a Nazi coin from <laughs> some kind of... I don't know, like a pawn shop or something. And I thought, wow, this is a piece of history right here. It's quite <laughs> there. You know, there's a uh, there's an interesting side note to the uh, to the story of David Irving, uh, mm-hmm. which is that in a way, because of him and because of his work, it's now virtually impossible for historians to go into the German archives to do research. Yeah. And and it's very interesting what's going on now. For you as a researcher, as a historian. You have to have a million and one permissions, qualifications, and even then they don't allow you into the archives. They you have to go in with, you know, some kind of escort, and it's 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 actually it's it's right now it's virtually impossible to really get primary sources without going through all those hoops. It's it's just a a sad reality now to uh, to anyone who's this interested in history, you know, to try to at least find an objective uh, approach to uh, to the events of the Second World War. Mm. Yeah, because of him, they created this narrative that translating directly from the actual original documents is somehow uh, bad work for a historian. Right. <laughs> and so one of the things that David Irving talked about for years is all these his- other historians, all they're doing is quoting one another. Yeah. One historian makes a book. Another historian just quotes that book and uses it for his book. And um, meanwhile, none of them are actually <laughs> going to the archives and reading these things. And uh, yeah, it's it's very fascinating. But yeah. it, that really opened my eyes. But uh, by the time I was maybe 20-ish or so, mm. it, was, it was really just a bit heavy. Mm. All of that. And so... I kind of retreated from that, and then, and then I went toward my uh, 
like libertarian phases and things mm-hmm. like that. But, you know, I was essentially lying to myself. I never, I never unlearned what I learned. And in the back of my head, I always knew what the truth was. But, you know, it can be depressing. And especially when I was into that so young, it's just too much. And, mm-hmm. um, yeah. but then fast forward and, uh, my my daughter being born and then uh after that you know trump who was a disaster but his ascendance you know just kind of awakened some of those things and it was it was just one of those things where i'm like okay you know what i just i i'm a fascist this is uh <laughs> yeah I, I just like own that you know yeah yeah so what these leftists say about me it's true <laughs> It's funny. Um, This is a massive topic in and of itself. I mean, film is another world and this is this is its own world. There's a tremendous amount of sort of underground information that I've discovered on uh, on the true history of Germany, on the Holocaust, etc, etc. And I think our sphere, a lot of this is known in our sphere, but outside of the dissident right, uh, white identity politics, it's uh, verboten, right? It's it's not even something you can question. And it's it's really hard for us to break through that wall and, and get these truths out uh, without being kind of ostracized or punished or something or other. So <clears throat> do you... Uh, is is this a topic that you want to cover or connect to your film aspirations in the future? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, well, I mean, it, let's it, say it, I'm going to I'm going to give you uh, five hundred million dollars. Now go make a movie. Yeah, well, I, I think a, a production wouldn't even be allowed to begin if it was blatantly about that kind of stuff. <laughs> but um, I mean, I would personally love to. Um, I think that there is ways that you can um, create stories that are analogous toward the event and how that event is treated since. And um, you can create stories that cause further distrust in common uh, narratives, especially amongst America or the West in general. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, tr- t- Dude, if I could, I, I would make a movie about it tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Well, I was just curious. I would absolutely love to. And, and I know it's even a source of debate within our sphere whether we should just move on from it mm-hmm. or whether we need to make, we need to at some point basically um, clear the German's name. Yeah, I would argue clear the German's name. I think that that narrative is right at the very core of the modern Western consciousness Uh, of of modern Western identity. Now, Nullis lived in Germany and speaks German. So I wonder if you, I'm sure you've got some, some uh, angles on that, Nullis. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a very complicated topic, right? A lot of Germans um, have been, have been subject to decades of, of narrative that put them in a very, uh, how should I say, submissive position. Uh, post-World War II, anything that equated with a collective kind of German nationalism was uh, uh, very sharply discouraged. Local patriotism, as it related to the various states, I don't know, not many people might be aware of this, but Germany is a, feder- Germany is a federated country. So mm-hmm. each each member state of Germany, it's almost like the United States. So like you have like Bavaria, which is called the Free State of Bavaria, Theoretically, they could secede at any time. I mean, it doesn't happen. But but the point is that Germany is a federated state, which goes back to Bismarck, and it's a long story. But suffice it to say, um, so the sense of, of collective national uh, identity was discouraged greatly. Um, interestingly enough, in the late 90s and early 2000s, especially with the German soccer team being very strong and popular, there, there was kind of a revived sense of nationalism in Germany, but it was really misdirected and focused more on uh, sports ball as it was to anything else. So it was, it was uh, commoditized or commodified. It was, it was created more as a, uh, a pressure release valve than anything else. Um, the Germans in general, I think, um, and this is just my personal opinion, often have two opinions. You know, one opinion that they officially share with everyone, and then the opinion that they have in their inner voice, or maybe even only with people that they trust 100%. I think that that is still valid to this day. 
I think that you you um, you have a very strong element even before the Second World War. You had a very strong socialist element in Germany, and you still have that to this to this day. And that's also a very important uh, uh, factor in considering the general mindset and narrative in Germany. Um, I don't want to go into too much detail. Yeah, about yeah, things, yeah. But 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 I, just to give a general idea. And then when it comes to this topic in particular, the Second World War, they are extremely sensitive. In yes. other words, there are laws in Germany that that you can go to jail for essentially questioning any narrative, um, certain narratives, uh, not to be, you know, to be more specific. You know, um, I think Ernst Zundel also had like a, a lot of problems with this legal problems. And then you also have this, uh, <clears throat> you know, you what's I, oh, well, I this is this is a uh Oh my goodness! I'm drawing a blank right now. But uh, that 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 uh, 90 year old lady who's who's uh, I know. she just got sent back uh, to jail. I, I, uh, yes, thank you very much. I and my apologies, my apologies because that's a shame that I didn't remember. I, that name has to be, that name has to be burned into our memories, our collective memories, because it's not a question. And I'm sorry to track a little bit off the topic, but this is a very sensitive topic and people have to be very careful how they express themselves, especially people living in Europe. Mm -hmm. So we have to be careful how we say certain things. So we don't want to put anyone in any kind of compromising situation. With that said, you know, there are people who are out there that are very brave and, and we have to really respect that and support that because the question here above everything else is about honesty and 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 objectivity and and you know how can you live in a world that's not ob uh, you know objectively fair and and how can you accept that without you know going nuts you know i mean so so anyway i digress but i hope i i don't even know if i answered your question donald Oh yeah, it's. I mean, I you. I mean, I, I like just. I went off on a tangent here, so. <laughs> no, 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 it's that. fine. Yeah. It's related. I mean, th this this is how this show works. Is that we? It's kind of like an unboxing show. We unbox ideas, you know, and etc. Quick note: I'm I'm actually going to be interviewed on the Citizen Reporter on January first, and she's a a friend who specifically focuses on German history and finding the truth of it. That's the whole theme of her show. So fantastic. Jerome, I will get you connected with her and you two can really, fantastic. really go. So let's get back to you though. Um, so I did, did you finish answering the question about coming to your racial awakening? Last we heard you were a libertarian. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that was the last of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, when my daughter was born and then the ascendance of Trump, that's when I just kind of admitted to myself, yeah. you know, what I am and what yeah. I want from society and um, at the way I had been living was not bringing me any sense of uh, fulfillment or satisfaction or even honor or dignity. Right. And so, you know, there are other ways of thinking that do bring those things into your life. Mm. Um, the, the one thing I'll just briefly say, Nolas was talking about Germans that have like the public opinion and then the private opinion. Uh, my daughter is five and a half. I've been taking her to German school for a year and a half. And wow. so I've got to talk with some of these people and in private one-on-one, -on -one, the conversations I've had with them is either one, they don't really care about the event. Um, cause they're just like, it has nothing to do with me. I didn't do anything, you know? Sure. Um, or B they try to like lessen it and be like, well, you know, it wasn't as bad as they made it out to be or whatever, but show them one movie about the Holocaust that involves gas chambers. And I guarantee you, a wave of guilt will wash over them. Mm -hmm. And again, this is why these things are important. It's like when you talk to uh, boomers, you, you know, I could talk to like my boomer parents and talk about fascist principles, but I'll never say that it's fascist and they'll agree with all of it. They get five minutes of Fox News and everything I said has been undone. So there's a lot of power through um, not just the news, but in regards to movies, parable really influences people and it can even make them act a certain way, even if they themselves don't believe it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this gets back to the topic of narrative, parable, storytelling, film. Um, it's fascinating to me. I guess I still have more questions about your politics before yeah, right. we go into the film stuff, though. You earlier were talking about fascism. Could you 
again, I always try to advocate for people who are new to this show, uh, you know, who are just trying to grasp, uh, or sorry, uh, grasp what we're doing here. What is it about fascism that is, say, appeals to you or, or that other people should know about? Well, okay, so let's kind of like narrow it down first, because we, we see these labels all the time of fascism, third position, national socialism, so on and so forth. And they all get kind of used as kind of catch all terms, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of that is because of, because we're still trying to figure out exactly what we would be in this day and age, because we're not going to be the NSDAP tomorrow and we're not going to be. Uh, just like, you know, the uh, Mussolini's, you know, men in, in the 20s or anything like that. It's a different sure. time and a different age. Yeah. And so yeah. I use the term fascism a little loose. Mm. Um, but essentially, the immediate interest is the duty to the state. And, you know, that might offend like libertarian or conservative principles, you know, because they harp on the individual. But when I hear the word the state, I'm thinking of my people as a collective. Yeah. It's a duty to them. And so our duty to the state is to benefit all of us. So it provides a sense of duty. It provides a, a sense of um, compassion and a, and a sense of well-placed empathy because empathy can be placed in negative ways. Mm-hmm. And – excuse me. Um, then the, in, in the emphasis of – uh, preserving of culture. Now, yeah. I maybe I'm not like an Italian fascist because they would have more, say, mystic qualities. Um, mm-hmm. Italian fascists did not have an emphasis on race because that was deemed materialistic. Okay. Um, so I guess I would lean more towards the national socialist side. Yeah. So, but regardless, whatever, I'm not really, I don't really care if anyone calls me third position fascist or national socialist or whatever. But um, for me, for myself, it's my race first. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So my understanding of fascism is in a sense, it's a state ideology that in a sense is an extension of the individual who is in it, who is a part of a race and a, a part of an ethnic group. But in our case, so, I mean, there could, I suppose, be Asian fascists, right? If they, right. Carry their, you know, that their racial identity and all of that was, you know, was central to, to their ideology. But that's, a, that's what's insane to me, that in this modern day, our enemies are constantly calling us fascists. And not a single person on our side has said, well, what is fascism? They have done zero research. And then if our enemies are calling us that, then maybe it's a good thing because they're they're bad, you know, in the sense of the way that Antifa behaves and destruction, Marxism, et cetera, et cetera. Well, so it, it's just it kind of boggles my mind that no one has actually put or not not many people have put enough effort into at least understanding what it is. You know, Donald, if I could if I could just quickly interject on this, because it's a very important point that has to be said. The, the term fascist is used very loosely by yeah. this yeah. parasitic elite. Exactly. We have, to, we, have, we, have to, we have to understand a few things. First of all, you know, for them, the way they uh, define themselves, their creation mythology, if you will, is defined by the Second World War. Um, whether this is the, uh, the, the post-Soviet Russian mentality, even today you, you see the Russians speak about them being liberators of Europe. And, and that's really quite a, an insult to many people yeah. that Sweet. had family in Central and Eastern Europe. Um, and then you have on the other side, you have the 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 allied mythology of re- liberating Europe. And and both of these are defining themselves against the, uh, the, the Second World War, against, you know, the NSDAP Germany and against fascist Italy. That's what they're defining themselves again against to this day. So anytime you hear conservatives speak about, you know, fascists, they'll call Antifa, they'll call anyone else who in their twisted kind of interpretation is authoritarian, they will call fascist. And for them, the term fascist is equated with authoritarianism. Precisely. And so, yes. so this is an important point to make because we have to clarify that 
you know, if Antifa is doing something or if BLM is doing something or if you're talking about Bolsheviks or sure. if you talk about the neocon Trotskyites, because mm. that's what they are, well, right, <laughs> then, then what you're really talking about are, are Marxists, are Bolsheviks, are Soviets or, sure. or what have you, sure. and, and who are primarily responsible for a significant amount of death in this yeah. world. And, and 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 that's being downplayed. So so th I'm sorry to again digress, but this is an important point I think that has to be brought right, to light. Right, right. These you know the arts and politics, philosophy, ideology, they all intersect in a very important way, and it's perfectly important for us to talk about that on the show. We we have had really good guests who go into these things. Uh, one of our previous episodes. With Gabriel Vinto talks about his book, uh, the doctrine of of the National Workers Party, I believe it's called. And you know, here he's an, a, in, I guess, an Italian national socialist. So these things have to we have to discuss them more. Artists have to discuss them more. We have to know what are our themes, what history are we rooting to. In Imperium Art, we frequently talk about continuity with our history. Well, we have to understand our history, right? And, and that this is all part of that. These are kind of beads on the thread, so to speak. So it's exciting. It's interesting as well. Um, I'm going to move forward with with uh, with questions with Jerome. So what are your thoughts generally on the former alt-right, the, the dissident right? Uh, where where has it been? Where is it heading? Generally, I want to get your overview of where the dissident right is right now in the, or the white positive sphere. Oh, well, <laughs> only big questions on this show. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. It's yeah. um, it's a little it's temporary, too. Right. It's yeah, just... I mean, it, it, I would just sum it up as disorienting and a bit chaotic. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that comes with the fact that we are a. Uh, a, a movement slash non-movement relegated to the internet. And this brings out the the worst of us and really makes us act dumb, really. Mm -hmm. um, and the, But there is a big plus side. I mean, I've met a lot of great people. I've actually learned a lot of things and the, you can use it for good. But uh, um, I think the dissident right, which I use that term loosely, I don't really care for the term. I think it's a little... Yeah. Do I, I think it's uh, it's inherently negative. Uh, it's yeah. like we're losers, right? Like we're we're in some kind yeah. of a political ghetto of some kind, right? But and the that, other thing, that's why I, I tend to use white positive sphere or white yeah. identitarian. That's maybe a better term. But the other thing too is it's like read um read for my legionaries like from Cogianu. Uh, that's a dissident. Mm. We're not getting our teeth knocked out with the butt of a gun and being right. assassinated. Um, things are rough for us, but uh, it's like we're losing Twitter accounts and stuff like that. And um, I think we're so demoralized that those things are tantamount to what people went through over 100 years ago. It's a little unfair to them. Um, right. The former alt-right is, well, it's dead. Yeah. So it was, uh, you know, it was kind of fun while it lasted. It was too <laughs> It was too big. It was anyone right of center. Yeah. Um, there was no cohesiveness whatsoever. And so I think, you know, with uh, the unfortunate event in 2017 that we all know of, yeah. uh, in, a, in a bad way, I mean, it, in a way it was kind of necessary. And... I mean, for me, when I watched that, that was my wake up call to, say, to think, oh, OK, we are not where we think we are. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we are not in the timeline that we think we are. And there's a lot of work to be done. And mm -hmm. it, it was it also began my acceptance of, you know, something unforeseen could happen tomorrow. And if there was some kind of way we could capitalize on some event, that'd be great. But this is a generational project. Yeah, for sure. Well we, need, we need the sphere to be thinking in terms of years, decades, or even centuries. Mm -hmm. So if we're only reacting to things today, then we'll stay exactly – we will stay exactly where we are or worse, we'll just slowly decline yeah. uh, while being outraged. And <laughs> then we just have people that merely want to survive, and that's boring. So <laughs> there's nothing empowering about that. 
Yeah, yeah. Would would you say that like who would you say are the emerging leaders in in the white identitarian sphere? Um, <laughs> I wouldn't. I just wouldn't use the word for anybody because um, we're on Twitter, yeah. So, <laughs> but but I mean, we have a lot of great people. We have a lot of great thinkers. Let's like I work with you know Tyler. I think he's a very intelligent and wonderful Amazing. person. Amazing. Uh, guy. He's just a all around fantastic guy, and even sure. like, and we have some disagreement, some disagreement. Ugh, excuse me, some disagreements, but <laughs> um, you know, he's uh, you can talk to him about anything. We have yeah. uh, so him all the way to you know Mark Brahman, Josh Neal, uh, Richard's always in the picture, you know. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of people out there, and I also think that there's a lot of potential people that are. Um, not emerging because, I mean, it's just observe, uh, observe the alt right, whatever it is, online for like a week, and it's like why? Sometimes you wouldn't even want to be a part of that. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I I wouldn't use the word leaders, but there are some people that are doing some great work and trying to actually think about our future. Okay, okay. Well, let's switch it over back to into film now. Let's let's get to the meat here. Uh, what are your thoughts on filmmaking regarding white identity politics? Um, well, there's not. It's a big, broad question. Yeah, well, break it down. I guess I would say there is. There's identity politics involving whites in filmmaking. It's just not going our way. Right. Um, and that's the norm. Yeah, that's the norm. And um you know, in filmmaking for years, even the stuff that uh, is moralizing and beautiful and mm-hmm. touching wasn't made to empower whites, mm-hmm. but it's still good for us. So there's just there's there's not really anything that's made specifically for that, to my knowledge. There's some filmmakers that you know there's kind of rumors around, but who who knows? But uh, I would definitely like to see more of that. But we obviously know that it's more of an attack on us than anything. Um, what I would I hate seeing the most is what 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 they've been doing the last, especially the last ten years or so, is actively using things that whites are naturally act, naturally drawn to in order to basically yes. trick them. Uh, I. I'll, I'll mention it later, but uh, Midsommar is one of the most egregious examples. Ugh, yeah, I, I heard of it. Mm-hmm. I, I saw a review of it, and I thought, I have never seen such a disgustingly anti-white concept. And the story, the narrative is is it's it's like so aesthetically the charts. Aesthetically, it's like everything that we like. Yeah, you know. And people see the trailer, and they and, and white people want to see that kind of stuff. Yeah, it's it's a bait and switch situation, which it is. is it's uh, it's it, the movie is pure, just tribesman type stuff, man. <laughs> it's, it's it's rough. Oh. Well, let's turn it around though. Let's talk about elements that you know. As a filmmaker, if you're giving advice to filmmakers, and and when I say filmmakers, I also mean script writers, actors, people who are involved in narrative. I, I do comics, for example. You know, th- this advice would be to all of us. What what guide can you give us in terms of the? These are the elements that you should try to add into your your narratives. So I'll speak as if I'm a, uh, like I'm assuming that I'm talking to an actual artist. Go for uh, it. And what I would say is if you're wanting to make art that is geared towards being moralizing for us is, and this might sound kind of antithetical towards what we're wanting to do, but I wouldn't have such a rigid ideological structure during the creation of the project. Because you will actually um, really stifle your creativity and you may prevent um, some, what would I say, um, spur of the moment type ideas. You, you won't be going into it with feeling. You won't mm-hmm. be going into it with uh, that intimacy that should be had and you should be operating on that as you go. So like with films, you know, you write the script. 
however many times. Um, and then when you shoot, now it's almost like a whole other script because you're changing it as you go. Mm-hmm. Changing it as you go, you're tweaking dialogue, this and that. Something comes to you right then. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, the, depending on the, the location, you might change the way the camera moves or not moves or the framing, so on and so forth. And so I implore people to not go into it with like this super technical autistic mode of like, I'm going to do exactly this because mm-hmm. um, you'll just stifle a lot of your creativity. And we have uh, some, if you're an artist and you're of European descent, you have something inherent within you that you can tap into. And I would say just kind of let yourself go a little bit and uh, you'll discover some new things. And I think that the main goal should be for the the creator to be able to touch the viewer and try to understand the viewer. And the viewer should be able to learn something about the artist themselves and feel that they are a part of that journey with them. And it, it brings that connectedness together. Mm-hmm. And that makes art that can last a millennium. Mm-hmm. You, you touched on very many important and interesting topics. Um, for starters, this the concept of uh, hitting the flow state, as it were, where it's it's some state between control and chaos, where your in your instincts and your intuition can flower, that can come out uh, in, a, in a you know in a productive way during the creation of the art. Any artist knows what the flow state is, and yeah. but even people in sports get into a flow state where the mind kind of shuts down and they react to situations as they're coming or musicians certainly do this in live performances, et cetera. So it seems technically though in film, that's gotta be one of the most difficult things because you're working with teams of people, you know, uh, as a director, how do you create that environment? And then how do you work with your actors and, you know, cameramen and these kind of people to, to allow that flow state to happen? So the way that I account for that is, um, First off, I, you know, I'm working with small budgets and Mm -hmm. I feel that uh, with the budgets that I've worked with, the films have been able to look like they cost a lot more. They do. I will attest to that. Yeah. So, I, you know, I'm happy with that. And so what I do is it a lot of it comes down to scheduling. And if you have talented actors, that makes that (laughs) that makes the world a difference because if you have very difficult actors, then your schedule is going to be uh, it's going to be a little rocky. Mm-hmm. So I've generally kind of worked with the same people uh, thus far. And so what I do is I have a schedule, but I also create enough time or I have a buffer to where we get the shots we know we need. And then we have time to kind of play. Okay. So, and sometimes you get the best result from that sometimes it's trash but whatever you don't know until you do it yeah Um, and uh so i always have like work time and then there's play time so that way i can kind of do all of that and uh yeah and a lot of that depends on location things like that but it really comes down to the time constraint that you have placed upon yourself so i would if in terms of filmmaking i would always suggest schedule yourself with a big buffer um so that you can either have that time to play around or if things aren't going right you have time to like just try and get it right Mm -hmm. nice now people who don't make film or aren't aware of how that process works they don't consider things like you know the sun is moving through the sky and the shadows are changing the light is changing those those are important nuances you know, film in a sense is is the medium of time itself, right? It's it's yeah. events in time, compressing time, stretching out time. It's quite fascinating, actually. So, what about the actors, though? Like, what is your approach to dealing with actors to get across to get the most out of them? So, it really depends on the individual, and I've been fortunate enough to be able to know the actors I've worked with quite a, quite a great deal before I used them in my work. Mm-hmm. And so you, you ju- you gotta meet them where they're at. Um, and I then try to, put, and then try to go ahead. I'm sorry, what? 
I just said I use that phrase all the time when I'm talking about red pilling people. But yeah, so you meet them where they're at, get them to that place, then push them. Mm. Um, so then I'll try to push them, you know, as far as they can possibly go. Mm. Um, I I don't have a specific answer because it's been different with everyone. Some actors need to know like everything that is meant by x y and z and sometimes i don't want to tell them what certain things mean but uh um so how about them, the the relationships between the actors i mean do you moderate that are you how much yeah. go ahead yes and sometimes it depends on what their character is mm -hmm. so for example um if we have these antagonistic characters here i might keep them separated throughout the shoot even mm -hmm. When we're not shooting yeah uh, things like that um but the chemistry between the actors is really important and i had a situation in uh one of the films that you saw um between a, a man and a woman and and things were kind of rough between them during the shoot um oh. to egos and so that was kind of tough to deal with and <laughs> to get through it i had to kind of uh um, keep one person's head big and the other one to just <laughs> not think about it. And that was a constant battle. That's tough. So, you know, when we're talking directing, you know, it's, I write them, I direct it. Um, sometimes I'm doing the camera. Sometimes my cinematographer is doing the camera. I'm managing the schedule. I am planning the food, planning mm -hmm. the transportation, yeah. planning where people are going to stay. Mm -hmm. I have to yeah. account for lighting, find location, do this sure. and that, blah, 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 blah. Um, so there's a, just a lot going on. Mm -hmm. I understand a lot of directors will use the tension between actors. Um, Jack Nicholson and Faye Dunaway in um, Help Me Out, the Chinatown. Chinatown? Yeah. Um, one of my favorite films. Uh, you know, they have a, a love affair in, in the movie, but apparently, like, Faye Dunaway hated Jack Nicholson throughout the whole film. And that was so shocking for me to hear that. I could probably see why they did the oil and water, whatever. But, um, you know, yeah. is what do you do? How do you how can how do you take reality and then somehow kind of squeeze drama out of it and, and make it work on film? Is there any kind of formula or, or you just have to kind of go with it? this is something where it's unique to each director um some directors just merely say this is what i require and you do that and then there's some directors that give people a lot more leeway mm -hmm. there's some that have a lot more intimate connection with the actors and whatnot um in the situation that i was discussing um between these two actors toward the end of the film uh there is this kind of rift between them anyway and so mm. with the actress, I just, I let her have her ego, but with the guy, you mm. know, I just try to explain that, uh, you know, how different their characters are anyway. And there's this space between them, um, due to just, uh, personality differences anyway. And so, um, we need to let this space continue even, uh, when the camera is not rolling. So it sounds to me very much that a director is a psychologist in a way, you know, yeah, and, and you have to, even if you don't want to be, you have to, cause, uh, man, even, even on something that's, that's low budget, it's the, there's actors are different people, man. Yeah. <laughs> different. Know, tell me about it. I, I know, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I have some, my own stories, but, um, so now I'm, I'm just trying to kind of pull it back into the white identitarian sphere here. So there are other filmmakers in our sphere. And of course, I, you know, everyone has their vision. Maybe you could talk a bit more about, you know, what are your thoughts or even your advice for filmmakers who want to make white positive movies and movies about, you know, our experience in the distant, right? We're talking explicit. You can go for it, man. I mean, just let it out. Just, you know, we, we want to document your thoughts and these things will carry on, you know, as a part of this Imperium Art project so that people in film can can use this as a resource. Um, well, I would. Well, you know, I, I, I read Nolis's essay on Imperium Art 
Okay. And I wrote a response, and a lot of it kind of gives some advice or things okay. to really consider. Would you like to read your response? Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, okay. Pull it up here. Because I don't. Right. Uh, da -da -da. So while you're doing that, I, I'm working on a film now, and uh, I've discovered that directors have different approaches. I personally like things to be very planned out like every single bit. I, I, as a storyboard artist, I've had to do that. You know, I get paid to do that. And, and I, I help to visualize camera movements, even what the actors are doing. And, you know, it, I feel that the more structure, the better, but yeah. I, I understand how that could be stifling for certain kinds of people. Um, in the, the director I'm working with, this is his film, you know, and I'm acting in it and co-authoring it, et cetera. But, um, I let him call the shots and he has a real loosey goosey, <laughs> uh, intuitive way of, of yes. it's the total opposite of how I like to work. So it's very hard for me, especially because it signals to the other actors that, oh, we're just here to have fun and, and I'm trying to stay in character and it just, it's, it's a, it's a problem. So we're rethinking the whole process. Well, I do in when we're not shooting, I do try to really push them to stay in character the whole time. And now, even though I'm not really one that's like extremely structured mm -hmm. when I'm shooting, I do require some people around me that do possess that characteristic mm -hmm. because it can kind of help um, with just general organizing anyway, because my mind's in so many different places. Um, you know, I need help with some of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if it was up to me, I would, I would, I wouldn't even think about time, and I'd have an actor shoot for thirteen hours straight. But you know, <laughs> can't do that. <laughs> so it's like I do need organized people on the set with me. Okay. So you know, I I am fortunate that I have the kind of producer that I have and the kind of project manager that I have as well. Yeah. All right, I got this uh, response. So I read Nolis's essay on Imperium Art. It was a, uh, and, and it was it was very good. That was the first time I read it. All right, so here it goes. I wrote my own response. Do it. After reading Nolis's essay on Imperium Art, I poured myself a drink and took a moment to contemplate what my response would be to this well-thought-out and necessary piece of writing. There is so much I can say about what has contributed to the decline of art for Europeans that it's hard to even know where to start. Nolis made mention of contemporary poetry and its lack of moral purpose, or even more specific, its total and complete absence of artistic merit. My, my expertise is in film and like contemporary poetry, the medium of film is obviously inundated with vapid and vacuous works that do nothing but make a mockery of the craft while simultaneously subverting white people. The number of good films rapidly decline each year. And even when there is something aesthetically interesting, it is riddled with destructive and demoralizing symbolism. Instead of an exploration into the meaning of our existence and promotion of evolving as a race, we are instead treated with works that prop up the individual just for the sake of propping up the individual. This breeds the everything can be art type people. This has become the general feeling about art in the modern age. Instead of discriminating tastes, we have an elite promoting the efforts or lack thereof of people merely throwing anything out there and calling it art. Can anything be art? I have to answer that with an, with an emphatic no. I think most people in our sphere have the same opinion. The mere fact a camera recorded something or somebody wrote any grouping of words on a page should not have the luxury of immediately becoming art. Only in modernity could this assault of grandiloquent hollowness exist. Reading through the Imperium Art essay, some questions came to mind that I feel should be addressed or rather simply discussed. The concept of originality is a complex issue in regard to good art. Does good art have to be original? Is originality even that important? Does the fact that something has already been done before somehow diminish the artistic efforts presented before us? Should all Imperium art be something never seen before? My gut, of course, tells me that good art should strive for originality. However, that may not really be an honest response. Working toward originality for originality's sake won't automatically make something good. It doesn't mean that the artist will touch somebody in a way that great art should. Perhaps we shouldn't have too much of an emphasis on doing something never seen before and instead simply encourage the artist to be bold, daring, 
and most importantly, display their unique characteristics that are inherent within them, as well as within our people as a whole. The commodification of art is a massive problem. You could do away with all non-white influence in our media, but capitalism will still destroy our art. Film being a commodity means constant drivel being churned out, of course. The other result, however, is several establishment approved artists doing seemingly very original work. The fact that it comes off as original somehow makes the work worthy of praise instead of the reality of what the finished work really is, which typically is shit. This is simply a trick to manipulate white audiences into buying more, demor buying into more demoralizing stories and visuals. Its originality is clearly not a plus for European peoples. Ari Aster and his film Midsommar is one of the most up-to-date offenders of what I'm detailing. This tribesman created a film that was made to lure white people in with its Scandinavian pagan aesthetics. Blonde women with flowers in their hair, maypoles, runes, pagan rituals, and so on. You can hear Mark Brahman and Richard Spencer break it down on their podcast, but they saw exactly what I did. A most offensive and egregious example of subversion through a seemingly unique and original form of psychological horror. It attempts to mystify and confuse in order to distract from the underlying symbolism that is most destructive to our psyche. I can go on forever about this filmmaker, but I'll just simply leave it there. If I name some of the great filmmakers of the last hundred years, I would be naming artists that, more than anything, attempted to create something that could touch somebody's soul and leave a long-lasting impression. In doing that, it automatically became original. Tarkovsky, Brasson, Kieslowski, these are men that achieved greatness without setting that as their main objective. Their objective was to help the viewer understand their own existence and purpose in this life. At the risk of rambling on about the topic of originality, I guess I would just say that if you try to do something that is extremely personal and intimate, the originality is generally a byproduct of that. This is all assuming, of course, this is a real artist we are talking about. Not everybody can do art, no matter what the establishment says, but that's a whole other discussion. Another topic that is important in the discussion is the use of transgressive art. And this is a tricky subject. On one hand, our transgressive artists, those that are actually transgressing against the system, not the ones that are harping to be doing that, are some of the bravest artists out there. We need them. Even if they are nihilistic and hedonistic, at least they are out there poking at the current liberal order. Having said that, would we want such an artist in an Aryan Imperium? Would we want these types making works that attempt to chip away at our state? Well, of course not. However, transgressive material can be created for several purposes other than pure nihilistic entertainment. This really kicked into high gear in the late 60s and into the 70s. Film began to really sex up the transgressive. Gritty stories about the dregs of society that mistakenly didn't serve as a warning, but instead asked for an unhealthy level of extreme empathy and understanding from the viewer. What this does is it trains the minds of the viewer to start to normalize the drug addicts, pimps, hookers, gay nymphos, and other degenerates, and instead of wanting to shun them or fix them, now the viewer simply wants to understand them and live side by side with them as they continue the destructive ways, thus inviting otherwise normal people into their world in the gutter. But how can we use transgressive material as a way to add more complexity to, to Imperium art? Earlier, I mentioned how currently this type of work is not used as a warning. This should change. What I mean is one could, in a sophisticated manner, use these very ideas that are typically glorified, but instead use them as a warning of what our future may be or simply presenting the current reality of what Western liberalism has done to generations of good stock. With the correct writing and symbolism, one could create work that can show a painful reality in order to figuratively throw cold water onto the viewer, wake them from their sleep. Two good examples of current filmmakers that, whether they know it or not, do this, would be Danish filmmaker Lars von Trier and Gaspar Noé of France. On the surface, some of their material may seem like something that would put Weimar to shame. However, with a closer look, one could see they are making very damning statements about the kinds of people they present. The choices they make and their impulsive behavior leads to pure destruction. These kinds of filmmakers are extremely helpful in the right hands. Whether they are helpful or not to the masses currently, those who are interested in Imperium art, I implore them to at the very least study them. However, I say this with a massive parental advisory label. In your Imperium art essay, you stated, 
this is a quote from the from the essay the overall value of a work of art is measured by its ability to take the audience out of space and time i can understand that but i i have to concur with russian filmmaker andrei tarkovsky when he says he believes that people go to the cinema specifically for time granted this was back in an age of more complex cinema but tarkovsky states they go for time lost time spent or time not yet had they go for living experience that widens enhances and concentrates a person's experience he states that because of this it not only enhances one's experience but it also makes it longer or significantly longer this is sophisticated and meaningful cinema that i'm thinking of an escape of time may be more appropriately said in regard to people simply wanting to watch for lack of a better word mindless entertainment in order to literally check out of life for 90 to 120 minutes however rarely are those types of films considered good art and they generally quickly leave the mind upon completion good art can make one's time on earth feel longer through its lasting effect on the viewer the philosophical puzzles it may present the romantic qualities that give rise to inspiration in one's life these are the things that aid in causing a life fulfilled i believe that this should be a goal of utmost importance for imperium art are we simply creating something that feels good for the duration of the work or do we want to create something that can enhance one's experience on this planet in my view imperium art should be a tad wary at times having too rigid of an ideological goal on creating of a project this can confine and restrict the ability of the artist in regard to tarkovsky saying cinema is about time this is created by the artist simply observing this is how a poet creates he observes and has an almost childlike quality of reacting in the immediate to his surroundings good cinema like good poetry does this exact thing when an artist has too strict of a goal for a work it may not allow room for the unforeseen or moments of revelation the artist may have that can be the key ingredients to creating a truly inspiring piece of aryan artistry this can be rather difficult we so badly want to create work that lifts us up while combating the empty and degrading work we usually get presented with that some may inadvertently leave behind all intuition this can lead to the problem we already have a piece of art that was simply made in order to create a piece of art thus lacking all meaning it was only made for utility which will certainly lack beauty so i encourage those in the scene or those wanting to create imperium art to question whether they are creating out of utility the things that are created for beauty always last longer than those created for utility architecture is perhaps the best example of this create to not only touch those that view your work but to do it to also understand your own self as well as the ones that came before you the work should be intimate otherwise it is simply a product so that was my response brilliantly written and delivered um Nellis, would you like to respond to it yes well first of all the first impression was bravo bravo mm. um this was this was a almost uh uh i mean i i started writing here points on 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 the various i mean uh, uh comments to the various points that you made but overall my impression of this uh, response was that it almost uh, filled in some of the gaps that that I believe were, you know, in 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 my essay. Because the problem that you have when you start writing an essay like this, you're trying to figure out something that doesn't exist, and then you're trying to figure out how you can write this in in you know uh, condense this down to maybe you know eleven to fifteen pages or what have you. I think in my in my case, it's eleven pages. So when when we get these responses and and your response, Jerome, was just phenomenal. It, it really felt like it filled out some of the things that needed to be say, said with regard to this essay. So thank you very much for that. Um, that that's just the first uh, uh, comment on it. Um, okay. Yeah, no, it was phenomenal. And 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 you brought up some really really good points. The one that that I found interesting was does does good art have to be original? Right. That that I think that that's a very important point. And, and, and it was an excellent point to that that we brought up. No, I, I agree with you fully. It does not have to be necessarily original. And, and let's be honest, you know, a lot of work today is derivative of some level, you know, something or another. Um, there was this adage, I forget who wrote who said it, but essentially every story that has been told has already that you know every story that they could say has already been told. Yeah, uh, your job is essentially to make the journey itself interesting. So that's kind of what along those lines. Um, but uh, 
overall, I mean, I there's nothing with which I disagree. I, it's just for me when I heard everything that you were saying, it it just felt like okay, perfect. This is like filling it in. It's just it, so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to, I'm glad to hear it. You know, the the when it comes to originality, my view is if uh, you know I touched on it in my response, if it can be a story structure or a theme that we've already seen mm -hmm. many times, but. If I feel I am learning about the artist himself, then that kind of inherently makes it more original. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people, if they sit down and say, okay, I'm going to create this original piece of art, um, rarely does that ever come out being any good. <laughs> right. No, and I agree with you fully. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, these things, you can't. This goes back to how you plan the structure of the work that you're going to do, you know? I mean, it's like you can write yourself into corners. And essentially, it's like if if I'm going to compare, I would say uh, put a Michael Bay film, um, mm -hmm. I don't know, next to Polish director Krzysztof Kieslowski, who mm -hmm. operates purely on intuition and beauty. And he is always trying to explore himself through his characters. Lars von Trier does this as well. He explores himself through his characters. He writes characters in a way to learn more about himself. Thus, it becomes more original. Gr granted, there's technical aspects that can add to seemingly original aspects of the film and whatnot, but uh, a Michael Bay film is purely product. Right. That's, a, that's a, what they would call the formulaic script, the formulaic movie, it worked in, in maybe 10 other movies before, and it'll be a blockbuster again if they promote it properly. That's kind of the commodification aspect of it, uh, the the manufacturing, if you will, of, of, yeah. of, of that art. And what, what I wanted to also mention, and I thought was very important, and I think the audience should be focused on this question of of this, you know, the, the, the transgressive nature of art, right? Um, you know, I, I write in, in, in later on in the essay about embracing the full emotional spectrum of, of the artist understanding that, you know, you, you shouldn't just focus on one aspect of your emotion. You need to really take full control of your entire emotional spectrum. If, you're, if you feel rage, if you feel anger, if you feel frustration, if you feel love, if you feel happiness, whatever it is that you feel you know, that's all a part of your identity. It's all a part of what you're adding into this creation, if you will. So so when you're when you're writing about the transgressive aspects of these characters, you know, the big question here, and I think and you touched upon this perfectly, was, you know, not just the condemnation, but the redemption arc. So is there is there any kind of value to presenting this character or is it just gratuitous? Right. Right. And so if it's just gratuitous, then it's it has less value. But if it if it pro provides some kind of a message, and again, I really like to make a point of always saying not moralizing. So, you know, you don't want to point that moral finger at people, but you do want to present a moral message of, of some kind, if that makes sense. Yeah. And, you know, like the, the work that I've done so far. So I have my own kind of strategy to basically get in. And, and Hollywood likes these very transgressive type of films. Mm hmm. Um, and so there's how I would get in and then there's the work that I would do after. Right. Um, however, with that said, you, okay. So you mentioned, uh, an arc. Okay. Mm -hmm. A redemption arc is what you said. Um, yes. I think that's one way to go about it. Um, the other way that you can go about it is what I, what I said in my response was you can use it as a warning. Right. So there might be a redemption arc for that character, but it is a warning for the viewer, right? Um, or, a, or it's just, or it's presenting a piece of reality. It's how you. It's just how are you presenting it? Because mm -hmm. what we see a lot of, especially like the last ten years, like anti heroes are usually pretty cool. And now in media, they've gone anti hero crazy, and so now you're presented with like genuinely just shitty people, and we're rooting for these people and right. liking them and. Um, even wanting to be like them. Yeah. And uh, that's not good. <laughs> well, yeah. well, if you think about it, the hero has become the villain. Yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, and so, so our concept of a heroic figure 
you know, as someone who struggles, who strives, who falls along the journey, finds, you know, this, this, this purpose and, and, and then ultimately succeeds. But, but these, these characters always have a strong moral core of one kind or another, something that gives them that extra value to why they're an interesting character for us. And now they twisted that whole thing around to make, just like you were saying, you know, the, the, uh, the selfish, the nihilistic, the uh, materialistic, uh, um, devious person, someone that people want to cheer for. And I think that that's, you're absolutely correct. That's, that's, that's the inversion of our reality. Uh, I guess it's, it's almost like, um, saying, uh, you know, how people like to watch these, these accident videos or all these crazy, uh, Russian, uh, uh, what's the, <laughs> I, I, it's a guilty pleasure of mine. I'll admit it. <laughs> you know, when you when you watch these Russian road rage videos, you know, those, it, those are good. <laughs> they are good. <laughs> but so there is a certain entertainment value to these things, right? And and so we have to be cognizant of the fact that that you know certain characters that are seemingly bad um, can be entertaining. And, and, and there is also, cause I, I don't know, this wasn't mentioned I do like to write movie scripts. Uh, I have written a few movie scripts, never done anything with it, but I love the genre itself. I love the, uh, the style of writing. I'm not a filmmaker, but I like to write stories out this way. Yeah. And, um, the big challenge always is how to make the, you know, the, the, uh, um, your, your, the antagonist interesting, right? You want to make, you want to make a good villain, you know, yeah. if you will. And to make that, you know, he has to be a compelling villain. And and the funny thing is right now, if you look at all the things that are going on, all these people that are just screaming and, and, and shouting all these non, uh, crazy things at people, I mean, on the streets, everywhere, they think they're the heroes. And the mark and the mark of a villain many times is that they believe that they're the hero of their own story. Oh, yeah. And so it's, it's very interesting stuff going on. And I think we have a lot of material we could use. Um, we just have to sort of figure it out, I think. And you're doing an excellent job with it. So, so my hat's off to you, really. Beautiful statements. Uh, this is a. It's. I could just sit back for the rest of the show and listen to you guys <laughs> talk. Um, let me let me respond as well. Uh, for starters, I think of my time in a looking at a movie. For example, I think, okay, my mind is not your garbage can like if, if mm -hmm. you're gonna make a film and i'm gonna dedicate time to watching it don't take a dump in my head you know i have to i'll that's a, two hours i can never get back and i'll always have those memories and so i take it i take film extremely seriously yeah. and I, I i hate the fact that our culture is just a giant garbage heap of this trash film that is the norm now um so anyway, let's. I want to back up a bit and actually talk about film as a as a, a me, the medium of film itself, and kind of just kind of get under the hood a little bit. And I feel that it's it's like a virtual reality or a model of reality. It creates a reality that you surrender to for the time that you watch it. And in an even deeper way, um, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with the term Cartesian theater. It's a, a, a neurological term or, and a philosophical term, etymological term, whereby they describe the mind as a theater in which your consciousness is sitting in the seat and watching the events playing out through your senses. And yeah. so, you know, people who are interested in neurology can, can look that up. Uh, it's film is very much like that. It's a strange uh, sort of like model, like a physical model of our own brains and our own perceptions of reality. Um, there, there's there's something that you were t talking about earlier about having uh, I don't know. You know, you, you experience catharsis, and you ex you identify with a character. You you live vicariously through that character, and your subconscious mind kind of logs that as like I'm the guy in Die Hard that jumped out of the building, or <laughs> whatever. You, you just uh, I'm Neo underneath there somewhere. I I'm the one who breaks out of the matrix, and we sh you know we love being the you know Le uh, Leonidas, and the, I'm the guy that led the three hundred. Uh, Greeks and da da da, and you know we we have this quasi or you know, quasi heroic experience. It's our modern mythology, whether we like it or not. It's the medium in some sense. So we artists, especially Imperium artists, 
have to be exquisitely aware, acutely aware that we are myth makers for our people and we must use these mediums because these mediums, film is an extremely dangerous medium. It's an extremely dangerous form of art in terms of what it can do to culture. And we're, we're already looking at it now. We're, you know, we talk about being in a, a state of decay, civilizational decay. Film has had a major role in that. So, you know, we reflect ourselves through it and, and such. So this is, you know, I, I just can't emphasize that enough. So responding to your points, though, Jerome, in the beginning of your essay, you were talking about the question of originality. Um, so something I, I frequently bring up, and this ties in Nolis's essay, is that the idea of, you know, uh, connecting with our historic continuity, our cultural and historic continuity. So this becomes the idea in, in the arts, the idea of carrying on tradition rather than individualism, for example. So I'm not knocking innovation or, or you know, being creative and, and making new uh, things, etc. But I do feel that there's something to say for looking at tradition and carrying it on. If you're going to, you know, I, that's just me. I feel that, you know, this is something debatable. It's an aesthetic question and and everyone in, in imperium art can make those debates you, you're going to have people who are far off on a tangent thinking no i'm going to completely reinvent this uh this medium <laughs> and and then others who may want to maintain the tradition so i i guess i'm kind of in the middle i see like start from tradition and then innovate so that would be my my uh, sort of position on that and we, we've just dis we've discussed the, the concept of the commodification of art and capitalism that I suppose is maybe makes us reflect on capitalism and how it affects the arts and brings up the question of, well, how can we fund Imperium arts uh, in such a way that they're not bastardized by capitalism? We have to be really careful of that. There has to be systems put into place that, you know, if it's art galleries or theaters, or concerts, uh, publishing, that, you know, in some kind of way, we artists have to have more f uh, financial freedom in order to, to do these things, to do Imperium art. So uh, another topic you're talking about is, the, you know, this transgressive art and I, I, this idea popped into my mind about revenge film, like revenge art. The idea being to, to the psychological horror against anti-whites to in some way show like, you know, you look at white liberals who are, yeah, we need more diversity in our neighborhood and tell the story of how they become the ones that are the first ones that say Black Lives Matter break into their home and destroy their family. And that, that's not something I wish on anybody. That's a horrendous thought. But that would be a, a very powerful uh, parable for the reality of that. You, you look at whites are the primary tax base for the United States and how in other Western countries and how the systems that are in place are shrinking and shrinking uh, white populations. So it, you know, if if these parasites wanted to live off us, why would they want us to disappear? And and <laughs> you see where I'm going. So like, you know, what would a world without whites look like? You know, that's a or what if whites all magically collectively moved to one area and then kept uh, uh, bordered ourselves off and kept all our technology to ourselves uh, you know what would the rest of the world would slip back into the 17th century so the, you know these are interesting thoughts and, and art and politics ec economics they 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 do overlap and i i don't like to just look at art on, on its own as if it's an island you know um, continuing on with my uh, my responses to your essay, uh, there's a kind of pathological altruism that whites have, and that's what got us in the trouble we're in now. So that that could be a topic, I think, of Imperium Art is focusing, putting a a white hot spotlight on on the dangers of pathological altruism, which is manifested in multiculturalism and other other things. 
So narrative art, uh, the, the the element of time in art, we talked, you talked about that time. Uh, how do I say it? It gives us an extraordinary transformative experience. So, you know, again, responding to the things you were saying, I think what I'm hearing is that Imperium art should transform the viewers, that if we're going to spend the time in the theater, you were talking about time, you know, are we losing time, gaining time, stretching time out? In the cinematic experience, you know, we love to kind of enter this illusory time of film. It's a it's a kind of a wonderful fantasy experience that we have. And um, I guess the question there is, is, you know, what's happening in that? How, how can we use the medium of time to transform people so that they come through with these heroic experiences, these these stronger uh, sense of continuity with our people, our history, et cetera? Um, so moving on, um, you're, this this concept of don't be too rigid on ideology in Imperium Art. This is something that the White Art Collective talks about. It's it's one of our kind of in the air conversations about how do you write specifically in music and poetry. What how do you write a song about our experience and not be cringy <laughs> or <laughs> preachy, you know, in some way? It's freaking hard. It's really hard to do. And probably why I don't write as much music as I, I could. I could write all kinds of songs. You know, I've got all kinds of, of tunes ready to roll, but I can't, you just can't go sloppy into that. You have to figure out how can I say something that's eloquent, beautiful, meaningful and even transformative. And I, I would say actually Hyrith is one of our greatest songwriters. She, she, she's amazing at doing that. Uh, Jack Hoyt is also somebody who's a hero in our sphere. And, you know, he's, he's uh, so they're able somehow to talk about these ideas in a way that their music contextualizes. It, it's a kind of a film for your ears, if you will. And in, in the two minutes of the song or whatever, you go through that, that kind of little journey. And uh, it's, it's powerful stuff. It, it, it transforms people. So, you know, so with, and with, I'm sorry. I, 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 go I'm ahead. Sorry. No, I was just going to say, like, Hyrath's process is a lot more explorative and, um, for lack of better words, like less planned, which really works for her. Mm. So she's operating on intuition and that's how I usually operate. And it's so when I talk about, you know, this rigid ideological and structural ways of creating work, um, I can just sum it up and basically, you know, trying to tell people to use their intuition more. And that takes a lot of trust within your own self. It's really, yeah. it's really, <laughs> it's really hard for an artist to even like their own work. Um, <laughs> It's hard for a lot of artists to even admit they are a real artist. Um, mm. They might feel insecure about it or they might think that that just sounds cringe, but it's like you have to acknowledge that, you know. And uh, so she operates on a very intuitive level. And I think that's why her music comes out being objectively good. Mm -hmm. um, she does a lot of great work and her new stuff's really great. I'm actually gonna, I'm actually on one of the songs that's going to be on her new uh, album. Nice. What do you, yeah. do you play? What do you play? Um, I'm humming and talking. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm a guitar player. I played for 23 years, but uh, I'm just I'm just talking. Oh, all right, all <laughs> but, right. Uh, anyway, no, it's good stuff. But so intuition is really key, and yeah. you're gonna find some things out about yourself. It's more vulnerable, so that's scary. <laughs> that, see, but, I, that's funny because I, everybody it, it, within the arts and the art process vulnerability is not weakness it's actually yeah. strength in a way right it, it's yeah. because the what we spend so much of our lives avoiding feeling things and avoiding co confronting our problems and we just go from one uh pleasure to the next you know avoiding uh becoming who we are if you will and so it, that's I think part of why I think artists exists in nature is that they kind of stop us and force us to to feel these things in some way if I could uh, just add to that, I'm sorry. Did you want to say something? Go ahead. I, I have uh, more to to talk about, but I, go ahead. I was, no. I was just going to say real quick. Um, you know, a good artist when they create, they're putting a piece of themselves into the work. There's mm -hmm. sacrifice involved, <coughs> and then they're yeah. and then they're presenting it to the populace, and they have every right to be nervous sure. or 
insecure about that. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it's a necessary thing. It's not weakness at all. Yeah. Nolis? Yeah, I just wanted to add that this is this is an interesting point we've discussed in the past also that, you know, they're very they're different levels of art. You have art that is more drawing upon directly drawing upon our traditions. You know, that could be folk art, folk music, folk dance. Um, You can even actually have a movie based on mythology, and that's directly drawing from those those primary sources if you will those folk sources and i think that 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 is uh you know and even that has two different levels to it you know you have one that acts as a uh, uh a curator of this art to keep it alive and to pass it on to the next generation but then you also have those that use it as a basis of innovation and then they create something folksy and very nice out of it but it's not it doesn't have anything more than the message itself of it being folk art right yeah. and then and 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 that to me is what i would call an organic representation of imperium art it's just that that's what naturally comes from us right that's something that that's a a reflection of our collective experience of our national experience if you will you know if you have a a scandinavian background or a german background or a hungarian background you know you'll have different sources from which to draw upon that's one aspect and then the next one is is in my view what i would call more of an implicit kind of expression of 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 uh of imperium art which is essentially sp- speaking to those uh, pressing issues that 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 are surrounding us today whether that's a moral issue whether that's a political issue whether that's a social issue and you don't speak about it openly directly but you're using metaphor or you're using some kind of an analogy to bring to light that particular issue and that's more of an implicit kind of message and then the third one is a very overt very explicit um more propagandistic kind of expression of imperium art which which basically then you just go full force and then you're you're really bringing home a message very specifically to your audience now within that frame you know, the question is, how do you make it interesting? That's really what it comes down to. How do you make the characters that you, you know, are interesting? How do you make the story interesting? How do you make that song interesting? How do you make that poem interesting? What have you? You have to give something creative into it. And I think that's where, I think, Jerome, and you hit, this is where I think you're talking about, is that that's where the individual comes in and, and adds their flavor to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. And... um <clears throat> The other thing, too, is that that individual needs to, uh, how should I say, especially in this sphere, I'll um, really advocate, if you're an artist, to read as much as possible. But what we typically read in the sphere are like political philosophy and history and things like that. And I encourage those to read as much fiction as possible. Mm-hmm. And it can really help the artist be able to, at the very least, um be able to use their mind a little better into creating these unique characters or yeah. ideas and stories and things like that. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, we should encourage more, uh, and, and really a lot of traditional classical literature is, is, is quite, uh, um, you know, most people haven't read a lot of the books, you know, like uh, 19th, 18th century uh, classical uh, works of literature. And I think that people should be spending a lot more time doing that. It would be definitely enriching and also help with this concept of, of creating the continuity that we need to getting back to our yeah. history and our narratives. So there was one more thing I wanted to bring up that you mentioned, Jerome. Utility versus beauty. This is mm. a fascinating topic, really interesting. And it's funny how architecture comes up right away. I would also say maybe fashion is is another uh, aspect of this this question of utility versus yes. beauty. Um, but then if you can you can flip it on its head in a way. So for example, folk dances, they there is a, a utility. They're celebrating a specific holiday or event of some kind, right? So um, teaching continuity with history and identity, this is something I find very interesting. So the utility versus beauty. I think every artist is, has their own philosophy on that. You, you're going to have people who are 
totally <laughs> uh, inebriated with beauty. And, and I, I love that. I, I definitely am that guy. But I try to balance that out with more utility and think in terms of I'm trying to convey a message. I want there to be a result, a measurable result with this artwork. I want to help people to transform out of the degenerate, uh, demoralizing world that we're living in and into a, 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 an Apollonian or, you know, a sort of Nietzschean, maybe Faustian uh, uh, sense of identity where we're, we're evolving past the, 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 uh, the garbage that has been kind of piled up on us. So it, that alone is, is, is a big discussion in itself. But uh, I don't know if you had any responses to any of my responses. <laughs> Yeah, so when discussing utility and beauty, uh, so you brought up folk dancing, for example, and there's a utility within that. But uh, I mean, the the beauty in that can't be denied in that, you know, it's unique to a people and a region and a culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so and it, and it comes from them. And it's something that was intuitive from them and then grew into this kind of just style of dance. And mm -hmm. so it's quite beautiful. Um, I would encourage a lot of people to actually listen to or read Roger Scruton, who was a British philosopher. He had conservative politics that I don't care for, but he dedicated his life towards aesthetic and beauty. And in regard to that, he's someone that you definitely want to um, read up on. But beauty serves a lot of different functions. There's an inspirational quality to it. There's um, a lot of psychological effects that it has. I mean, uh, you could put someone in like a cathedral or something like that, and their brain is doing something different as opposed to being in some cinder block gray building. You know? Right. right. Um, but beauty, training audiences to see what real beauty is and how to incorporate that in their own life is something really important. So this is something that I strive to do with my daughter, for example. And so every day I ask her the same uh, three questions, which is one, who does daddy love more than anything? And she says, me. <laughs> and then what are the most, what's the most important thing in the world? And she says, family and reading. And then I always ask her, what should we put in the world every day? And she says, beauty. Wow. And I think beauty can serve as a shield for our people, even as children. So I'll use her as an example. So... <laughs> By having her understand what beauty is, you know, she's been doing ballet for a year and a half. She's been uh, taking German for a year and a half. I've been teaching her guitar for a year. And we watch ballet performances at home, which has led to her enjoying even classical music. And we listen to those kind of things. It can serve as a shield for her when she's older. She has an understanding of what real beauty is, which can help her hopefully make some better decisions in her life because she can see the ugly and negative qualities that she'll be presented with. Mm -hmm. And I think that our audiences have to be trained to see this as well, because a lot of that is lost. And in fact, uglification is what is actually promoted and seen as cool and what, whatever. And uh, you'll even see those articles where they literally talk about like beautiful aesthetics being racist and fascist. <laughs> whatever. Yeah, and I read those and I'm like, yes. But, uh, <laughs> so, right. you know, beauty should be, at the center of that and of course it can come in different ways but I, th I think if you're wanting to make really long lasting art like you have to be striving to put something beautiful out there and whether it's imagery or the way that you make them feel so on and so forth people need to feel that again and film has so much power i reference tarkovsky a lot um i think he's just one of the purest artists in the medium of film and he refers to film since it's about time it's a complete encapsulation of actual time you know this recorded image with um uh for whatever duration of time with music and everything else and all the other mediums put together and what is time how long is time it's infinite so you're essentially creating you're, you're making the infinite tangible there's a lot of power in that and so putting beauty into that, you know, frame or story or the whole film or whatever it is, mm. you have, there's so much that you can do for the audience to uplift them and train them how to think. 
and it can and it'll bleed into their own lives. You know, it's like people people make a lot of personal decisions based off movies. It sounds ridiculous, Mm -hmm. but we see it all the time. We even see politicians say things because of Harry Potter. So it'd be nice if we can influence people to make better decisions in their own life because of something that's positive. Well, look at the you know, matrix and the red pill and, and that's so that's our sphere you know so yeah. we should be making movies art film songs etc poetry uh, that's creating a new narrative just for our people a new dialogue you know, yeah yeah i'm sorry i just wanted to uh, add the point here we had a conversation a while back with handsome horse about entertainment right versus moralization or or um propaganda if you will and mm-hmm. um and so, you know, his argument was that we're artists, we're entertainers, we entertain, we're providing some kind of an entertainment for the audience. Yeah. Now, now that, of course, you know, uh, opens up a lot of questions about what our role is as artists and, and how, how we can uh, uh, understand our position, you know, whether or not we should be overtly focused on the political message or the ideological message or the moral message. Or should we just provide really good, entertaining content that is objectively uh, uh, aesthetic, ex- objectively good, and you know, and and strive toward that perfection? And you know, this is a difficult argument because when I write, I never think about any of these things. I don't think about ideology. I don't think about um, any of it. Whatever I think about, so it, what I'm what I mean by that is I don't consciously think about any of that. All of that's already in my mind. It's already there. So the way I express myself is defined through the way I think, and the way I think is defined through how I believe and the things that I believe in. Whether you know it's my religion, my faith, whether it's my political leanings, whatever, whatever, whether it's my social uh, awareness. All of that is is subconsciously in my mind. And then when I'm creating something, I, I want to try to focus on that particular work. And I want to try to make that particular work uh, uh, um, as, as good as it can be. And so, so, you know, whether I succeed or not, again, you know, I don't know. But that's what my objective is. I don't consciously try to say, okay, now I'm going to write about, you know, um, I don't know, some, some, non, some, you know, BLM guy and this and that, and I'm going to make this whole thing about, I don't, you know, I don't do that. I don't consciously want to do that. What I do is I say, I have a, there's an idea in my head and I have to express that somehow. And how do I express that? I express that through the, through the experience, the calm, you know, the culmination of all the experience and knowledge that I have in my mind. Um, and this ties into, you know, what you were talking about earlier, with the grotesque, you know the you know this this transgression uh, transgressive art, and how how you can actually position the grotesque in a way that it 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 does give you the right message. You know, and I think that that's important by you know balancing the aesthetic with the grotesque in the right way is is something that we need to also consider. Essentially, you know, you could use degeneracy to combat degeneracy with correct, an art. and. It's a very it's a very difficult balance, though. It's a very difficult balance. But right. and especially you, you got to think about where we're at currently. So I'm thinking big picture and I'm thinking about being in the actual industry making films. So at this point, those kind of films, I think, are appropriate. You know, mm-hmm. um, it might that th- those kind of films might be different if, say, tomorrow we were in power and had everything that we wanted, you know. No, oh, I'd uh, want to have uh, Triumph of the Will again, a new version of it, please. <laughs> yeah. <I> mean, that, <laughs> that, that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, I mean, you can you can use those things. So, um, you know, there's a lot of uh, purity spiraling within our sphere. So that's why I say some of these kind of things, because they're just like, oh, my gosh, that's slightly degenerate. It has to go. And it's just like, whoa, 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 wait, you know, how, how's it being used? Um and is it obvious that it's being used in X, Y, and Z way, you know, so mm-hmm. on and so forth. So, that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, no, I was just going to say, you know, people, again, it's just they need to be a little less rigid. Of course, in the finished product, we need to understand, like, ultimately, was this a benefit for us or not? But, right. yeah, there's so many ways that you can use that. Yeah, I mean, we have to be a lot more creative in our process. I, I fully agree with that, you know. Yeah. So I just wanted to speak to the concept of, 
being an entertainer versus being an artist. I have a huge amount of respect for Handsome Horse, and he should be on a lot more shows because he's extremely intelligent, well-spoken, has a very fresh point of view on things. So I'd like to see him more out there, you know. But I, I'm, not, I'm not an entertainer. I'm an artist. And I know that my art can be entertaining, but I think there's a very distinct difference in attitude and approach and how you see yourself and, and your own work that you create. Um, it's, you know, I, 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 it's very difficult to talk about because he is right in many ways, and I'm acknowledging that, but I feel like there's a sort of a, a Venn diagram of these two things, that if an artist is too self-centered and kind of just, <laughs> you know, pleasuring themselves and just doing whatever they want and not having any sense whatsoever about the, the actual beauty aesthetics uh, connection to the, their audience, that's a, a bit grotesque, whereas some saying that all art is just entertainment is is extremely and i don't i'm not saying that that's what handsome horse is saying but that that's too far in the opposite direction so every, I, I suppose that these are just you know these are the questions and the struggles that happen in the process of art mm -hmm. and the, here what we're talking about is the reflection of the process of art we right. artists have to and that's a lot of what this show is about where this show is for artists as much as it is for historians so you know we're getting into that questioning process here and it's good you know it's good to lay out all the 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 ideas on the table and let kind of let people sort of find where they are on the map so to speak, but well, uh, the, I think I think the issue that that Handsome Horse brings, and and he makes a really good point about it, is that you have a lot of artists today that are used as vehicles of moralization to provide false moralization, and what they're saying is that you know, for example, wear the mask, and then you're going to have you know a million uh, actors and singers and what have you go on on various uh, programs and advocate for whatever cause the parasitic elite. <laughs> Uh, yeah. wants to promote yeah. and I think that that I I condemn that you know I don't want court jesters to lecture me on morality you know I, I really don't want that uh, to be the 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 norm but mm -hmm. at the same time you know you will have writers like T.S. Eliot or even if you go back you know you'll have uh, Tyratus you know the Spartan you know these these guys were were intimately involved in in you know in religion in politics in uh, philosophy so I, I think we have to make a distinction between, let's say, again, I'll use TSL, but we have to distinguish between T.S. Eliot and Lady Gaga. I really think we <laughs> kind of... I was thinking about her, actually. Because... You, you know, we have to kind of say they're not the same people, right? Yeah. But there is, a, there is a certain truth to the way um, some artists tend to overvalue their message. And mm -hmm. we also have to be cognizant of not over-representing what it is that we're trying to achieve. Mm. Uh, yeah. else, else it become cringy. Um, right, exactly. What, what my warning is to artists of all mediums is to not turn it into sort of your ego show. I feel that, you know, ego is you know, part of the tools of what we have to make stuff, and it's that's part of the, the deal. But if it becomes a cult of your ego then and performance and entertainment then i feel that your your art is less and less and less honest you mean and, you mean i can't change my name to a symbol is that what you're saying <laughs> well done very well done <laughs> very well done um touche yeah. but um the 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 opposite end of that spectrum is making art about something you know uh, an experience or something of that it, it becomes a bit more abstract but I'm I'm just I don't know I I feel like there's just much 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 too much of that kind of ego worship in entertainment mm -hmm. and the arts in you know in movie stars and all that's all about the the personality of that particular person whereas it it's vapid it goes right back to the very beginning of Jerome's essay about you know yeah. how how vapidity I guess is is ubiquitous well although AI might change all of that in the near future so oh, who knows. <laughs> yeah, the, I, what I see a lot with uh, these movies, <clears throat> and it's a constant problem, especially with like woke movies and uh, no. uh, very explicit leftist movies, is they uh, they put the 
the, the reason why it was mobi- what the reason why it was made or the nobility of the idea over what the finished product actually is. And so it can't be bad because it's about X, Y, and Z. So it's right. good. And therefore, uh, yeah. And then, you know, the other way that they try to tr- like tell people that this is good is like there was um, Jared Leto played the Joker in one of those movies. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, Suicide uh, Squad. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so uh, he was terrible. But like the whole marketing was about how weird he was and yeah. how method he was. And like so now so it's good because he went so method. And uh, <laughs> again, this is like when I when I use the term grandiloquent hollowness it's just they're really trying to sex up and decorate you yeah. know an empty- once again it's the cult of personality you know and and we as artists have to be aware of how the the, the machine works and, and that that's behind the machine that you know you're not going you know he's like the whole example you you just said, there's many, many other examples of that in film. You know, watch and see how uh, Robert De Niro freaks out at this uh, particular movie and we're blah, blah, blah. Anyway, I I think that we, we've kind of come to the conclusion that in a sense, we almost have to reinvent film in some way, structurally and, and culturally, even maybe spiritually. So this is a, a, a phenomenal show, and, and Jerome, I really, really want to thank you for sharing your thoughts, going so deep in on the uh, Imperium essay, Imperium art essay. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you guys for having me on. I mean, that was a lot of fun. Mm. So this is the kind of thing we could probably talk on and on for, and I, I feel like we, we covered a lot, though. We, we got some very essential points down. So once again, thank you so much for coming. Um, where, where can people find you online? Um, yeah, I mean, you just find me on Twitter at 3P Revolt, Jerome Schmidt. And so I, I talk about films, everything from Holocaust denial to films. So <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Okay. Awesome. And thank you again, Nellis, for coming and, and sharing your insights as well. Thank you very much for having me. Uh, as always. All right, ladies and gentlemen, have a great evening and stay real. Cheers.